Hey everyone, this is Pastor Todd and Miss Daphne. We pastor Transformation Church here in Seminole, Texas, and I believe that this message is going to be a blessing to you. Our vision is to transform lives and change the world. We want to invite you to join us online or in person Sundays at 10.30 a.m. or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We hope to see you there. Hallelujah. Well, let's get right into the Word of God today. Turn to James chapter 1, verse number 22. I'm going to piggyback what I taught on last Sunday on self-deception. James chapter 1, verse 22. And um, it was a very powerful message last Sunday. I want you guys to go back on our YouTube, all of our social media platforms, and watch that service um, because it was fresh manna from heaven. Actually, um, of all the years that I've, I've pastored and preached, I've never preached a message on self-deception. So it was fresh from heaven. And um, so we, um, we're going to do part number two today, and then we'll go into our water baptisms. James chapter 1, verse number 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. This year, we just really believe that the Lord put it on our heart for a church, for our church. This is the year to apply the word, to be doers of the word. And we're going to learn all about that this year. We're going to learn about how applying God's word to your life is very beneficial. Now we know Christianity is more than just a confession of faith to him. It's actually a lifestyle change. You know, a lot of people think that if I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I'm going to heaven and all's good in the neighborhood. Well, how I many you know there's much more to Christianity than just knowing that you're going to heaven and not hell? And we believe that the Word of God is, is like an instruction manual. It gives you the, the do's and don'ts, for lack of better words, and the instructions on how to live this life called Christianity. And Christianity is all about applying what God's instructed us to do. So let's look at this scripture again. Notice verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But notice verse 25, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. Somebody say continues in it. It's not a one-time event. It's something that we got to continue to walk in. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of this work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So we're learning about how not to be deceived. Notice verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers. Notice this, deceiving yourself. Those two words, deceiving yourself. I mean, you know, James being led by the Holy Spirit was basically telling the people, Christians specifically, that you can deceive yourself. I mean, it's, it's very... Obvious here that he didn't really kind of mess around with the words, but we can actually deceive ourselves. This word deceiving in the Greek, it means false reasoning. Or we can say it like this, a false reasoning is meditating or thinking on the wrong things. Deception, self-deception takes place when you think on the wrong things. Hallelujah. Now let's look at what the Passion Translation says about this, these verses here, verse 22. Don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it, for that is the essence of self-deception. So always let his word become like poetry written and fulfilled by your life. If you, just, if you listen to the word and don't live out the message you hear, you become like a person who looks in the mirror of the word to discover the reflection of his face in the beginning. You perceive how God sees you in the mirror of the word, but then you go out and forget your divine origin. But those who set their gaze deeply into the perfecting law of liberty are fascinated by and respond to the truth they hear and are strengthened by it. They experience, come on somebody, they experience God's blessing in all that they do. I mean, God's word promises you that you can experience his blessings. A lot of people are praying to be blessed. A lot of people are looking to be blessed. A lot of people are hoping to be blessed. Well, here the Bible is very clear about how you receive or experience God's blessing. How is it? By doing the word, by applying God's word to your life. I love the Passion Translation because 
Verse number 22, don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it. Come on, don't just sit in service today and listen to me preach and then go home and do nothing with it. Come on, high five someone say, he's preaching to you right now. He's preaching to you right now. That's what this scripture is saying is that we just don't come to church to sit and fill a chair and listen to some good praise and worship and lift up our hands and, and get the Holy Ghost goosebumps. No, we come to church for a specific reason, not only to worship and, and love on our Heavenly Father, but the Word of God has been given to us today so we can apply it to our lives that when you walk out these doors today, you have something that you can grab a hold on and exercise your faith on and see God move in your life and experience the blessings in all that you do. Hallelujah. See, many Christians are self-deceived or in self-deception and not experiencing the blessings of God. Many Christians believe more in, in the situation and what the situation says than what the scriptures say. Let me say that again. Many Christians believe more in what the situation says than what the scriptures say. That's self-deception. Turn over to Matthew chapter 19, verse number 26. This is the reality of Christianity. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 26. Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Let me say that again. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The reality of Christianity is simply this. When you apply God's word to your life, all things things are possible. That tells me that your present situation can change. That, can that tells me that your finances can change. Your relationship with your spouse can change. Your, your job, whatever's going on at your job, it can change. Why? Because with God, all things are possible. What you're facing today doesn't have to be the end. What you're facing today can change, and it can turn and be better. Why? Because God's all about being in the blessing business. He wants you and I to experience his blessing. How does that take place? Having a reality of Christianity that with God all things are possible. Many Christians will believe more in their impossibilities of the situation instead of believing that all things are possible with God. Turn to Acts chapter 20, verse number 22. Acts 20, verse number 22. If you're visiting our church today, if you're watching online, our church, we believe in the Bible. We look at a lot of scriptures in church. I'm not going to preach my opinion. I'm going to preach what the Bible says. I'm not a motivational speaker by any means. I can barely sometimes pronounce words. In fact, a lot of people have, have said that I have my own dictionary because I create my own words. Hallelujah. Amen. I create my own words. And, and I mean, how, many, how, many, how many seen the, the coffee makers that have the little thing on top that goes bloop, 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 bloop? I call that percolating. Creating my own word right, right there. And, and that means that there's some people that need to plug in the cord so you can get to moving, so you can get to percolating. Come on, high five someone and say, you need to percolate more. Some of y'all look at me like this white boy's lost his ever living mind. Acts chapter 20, verse number 22. Check this out. Acts 20, verse number 22. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying, The chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. See, what happens is many Christians are more moved by the change in the tribulations instead of being bound in the Spirit. See, I believe that the writer of this, these verses right here, they, he already knew by the Spirit of God that he was supposed to go into Jerusalem. And even the Holy Spirit told him that, hey, things aren't going to be too good there. But how many know that that even when you get a bad report, even by the Holy Ghost, it shouldn't move you quite because the Holy Ghost can still change things. I mean, no, we need those warnings by the Holy Spirit. We need those times that the Holy Spirit says, hey, what you're about to get into is going to be tough, but I'm here for you. I'm here to help you through it. I'm going bound in the Spirit, and you're going to get through this on the other side. Verse 24, but none of these things, somebody say, none of these things. None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, 
so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry with which uh, I received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. This word bound in the spirit, I love this. I go bound in the spirit. It means this, to be fastened with chains. To fasten to, to tie to, to be knitted to. How many know today, snap, chains have been broken? Hallelujah. Chains of the flesh, chains of addiction, chains of depression, all these other things in the soulless realm have been broken. But guess what? You can't be chained to the Holy Spirit. And it's not the kind of chains that you would think like a ball and chain. No, it means that you're, you're fitly knitted together with him, that wherever you go, he goes. Wherever he goes, you go. Why? Because you're knitted, you're fitted, you're chained together. I like that idea of having the Holy Ghost with me everywhere I go. It's one thing to know he said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. But in the dark hour, when you know that he's right there with you, oh, then you can boldly declare, with God, all things are possible. None of these things move me. Come on, I find somebody say, none of these things move me. Come on, find somebody else around you and say, none of these things move me. Hallelujah. Why, boy, starting to preach now. You better get ready. Turn to Mark chapter 11, verse number 22. Mark chapter 11, verse number 22. And Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Famous set of scriptures here. We firmly believe in these, obviously the Bible. But Jesus was talking about a mountain, which represents circumstances and situations. And I found this to be true. Many Christians have allowed the size of the mountain to intimidate them instead of speaking to the mountain. For all of us at one time or another in our lives, we've allowed that circumstance, that problem, that situation, the lack of come into our lives and begin to intimidate us as Christians. Let me just help you here a little bit today. There's nothing on this, on this earth that should ever intimidate you. You're born of God. And whoever's born of God overcomes anything in this world. Nothing should ever intimidate you. When you're full of faith, you're full of the power of God, and the blessing of the Lord is on you, nothing should ever intimidate you. Don't let the present prom promise intimidate you. Don't let the, all the circumstances that you're facing, don't let the trials and the tribulations intimidate you. No, with God, all things are possible. Speak to the mountain. Declare that that mountain's got to be removed. And say, oh, Lord, that mountain's getting bigger and bigger. Oh, Lord, I don't know what we're going to do. Oh, Lord, Ethel, help me. Ethel, I don't know. Something's got to happen, I thought. I mean, wine is not going to move your mountain. Come on, how fast someone say, wine is not going to move your mountain. Whining about it, grabbing about it, complaining about it, it's not going to do nothing but just wear you out. Start declaring God's word out. Speak to the mountain. Don't let that mountain intimidate you any longer. So the big question I want to ask you today is simply this. How do we overcome self-deception? How do we overcome self-deception? Number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Get the, truth about the get the truth about the situation. What does the truth say? If you remember last Sunday, I talked about the difference between the truth and a truth. A truth is you're sitting in a, tra a, a chair right now. But the truth is that, that God's word is always going to be there and will never fail. A truth will change. In a moment, you'll get up out of that chair and you'll go eat lunch. But the truth is forever settled. God's word is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is the truth about any and every present situation. So when you get the truth about the situation, the truth changes a truth. John chapter 17, verse 17 says this. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The word of God is the truth about your present situation. Come on, I'll say that again. The Word of God is the truth about your present situation. You, you know, and I'm, I'm learning this more and more, being in, in Seminole for all these years and pastoring this church. I, I'm, I'm learning this more and more that religion will, will tell you what the truth should be. And, and, 
I, I've even heard of people that, that have gone to church in different churches, and I'm not going to go into who's better and what. That don't, don't matter. But there, there's some, some part, people that have gone to churches, and they're not even allowed to read their Bible. Only the hierarchy in the church are to read the Bible. And how many know that's just wrong? I'll just, I'll just, just say it. That's just wrong. Everybody has the freedom to read the Bible. Hallelujah. And when you understand what the truth is about your situation, it can change everything about your life. Your truth, God's truth, or God's word is the truth. There in John chapter 17, look at verse number 8. Um, excuse me, John 17, go over to chapter number 8. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the what? You shall know the what? You shall know the what? The truth. And the what? The truth shall make you free. What is the truth is he talking about? Abiding in the word. The word of God. The word of God being the truth. So when we as Christians can see God's word as the truth about our present situation, our present situation changes. Your marriage changes. Your, your, your finances change. The health in your body changes because that's the truth about your life. Not what your body's saying, not what your spouse is saying, not what your job is saying, not what the economy is saying. The economy will change. Your body will change. It's called gravity. Gravity changes things. But the truth is, God's word has been forever settled in the heavens. And what God's word says changes everything. Number two, how do you overcome self-deception? Feed your thoughts on the truth. Because I said this, self-deception is basically meditating on the wrong things. But if you're going to quit having that self-deception in your life, feed your thoughts on the truth. Feed your thoughts on what God's Word says. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be anything praiseworthy, what? Meditate on these things. The Bible tells us what to think on. The things, verse, verse number 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Let me give you some wisdom here, some, just some insight that I've learned in life. If I don't have peace in my life, it starts with what I've been thinking about. I receive peace by changing the way I think. I receive God's peace by thinking on this whole list of things that he gave in verse number 8. On true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, anything praiseworthy. When I'm meditating on those things, peace automatically takes place. So if you're finding it hard to have peace in your life, change the way you think. Feed your thoughts on what God's word says. Hallelujah. How many love the Word? Come on, aren't you thankful for the Word of God? Man, the more that you're in the Word of God, the more peace you'll have in your life. Number three, how do we overcome self-deception? So number one, get the truth about your situation. Number two, feed your thoughts on the truth. And number three, you've got to speak the truth over the situation. Hallelujah, you've got to speak the truth over the situation. The truth, not a truth, the truth. A truth will say something like this. Well, I don't know if our marriage is going to make it. I hope God does something. D truth says, whatever God has brought together, let no man separate. Do you see the difference? Oh, I hope God can move with my finances. I don't know what we're going to do. It looks tough. No. Philippians 4, 19, my God shall supply all my needs. That's the truth. Hallelujah. You're not denying a truth. It's there. But how many know a truth can be changed by the truth? Philippians chapter 3, verse number 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the holy calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. You must understand, Christianity is defined as the great confession. We became Christians when we confessed Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Just because we confessed Jesus as our Lord and Savior made us that, that, that new creation in Christ. Our speaking, our confession must not stop. We must continually speak God's word over our situations. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14. Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our what? Our confession. 
hold fast to our confession. We've got to continue to declare God's word and hold on to that confession of faith in every situation that we're facing. Because it's the truth and the truth is what sets us free. God's promises are and will always be the truth about our situations. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 20. For all, somebody say all. All the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. I like the message translation of this verse, verse 20. Whatever God has promised gets stamped with the yes of Jesus. In him, this is what we preach and pray, the great amen, God's yes and our yes together gloriously evident. When we believe that God's yes is our yes, things change. Come on, when God's yes becomes our yes, things change. That's what this Bible talks about. That's what the Bible talks about. For all the promises of God are yes and amen. When God's yes is our yes, things happen. Come on, high five somebody and say, say things are happening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you seven, real fast, seven promises. Seven promises about your present situation. Because the promise is the truth. You take these seven things and your situation will change. Number one, seven promises about your present situation. Number one, God is in your situation. Number one, God is in your situation. God is in your situation. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Hallelujah, you've got a promise from heaven about your present situation. God is in that situation. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He is your helper. Come on, somebody. I said, he is your helper. And if he's helping you, why are you fearful? The Lord is my helper. I will boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I just like it. I like saying that with sass. What can man do to me? Amen. Number two, number two, seven promises about your present situation. God is working it out. Come on, somebody. God is working it out. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his promise. All things are working out for the good. Come on, somebody. God is working it out. Come on, say that with us. Say, God's working it out. Come on, do you believe that today? That's the truth. I said, that's the truth. God's working it out. A truth is, it might not look at it right now, but the truth is, God's working it out. And how does mountains move? When you say, God's working this out. Ooh. Number three, seven promises about your present situation. Number three, God's plans are to prosper you. God's plans are to prosper you. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Do you know that God's thinking about how to prosper you? God's thinking of ways to get peaceful things to you, prosperous things to you. He wants to give you a future and a hope. It's a matter of allowing that truth to become your truth. Allowing that yes to be your yes. And that's when things change. Number four, let me give these to you again. Number one, God is in your situation. God is working it out. Number three, God's plans, God has plans to prosper you. Number four, God is giving you strength. Come on, God is giving you strength. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse number nine. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, what? Then I am, then I am what? Strong. When I'm in my weakest place in my life, God gives me strength. That's the confession of my life. When I'm weak, God makes me strong. Hallelujah. That's what is the truth about my life. I don't have to be depressed. I don't have to be beaten up and beaten down all the time. I don't have to lay awake at night 
worried about my present situation. No, when I'm weak, God is strong. That's the truth about my present situation. That's the truth about your present situation. You're not weak unless you want to be. Come on, you're not weak unless you want to be. Because God's giving you a way out of being weak. He's called this to be strong. Then, number five, since you're taking notes, I can tell every one of y'all just writing all these down. Number five, God has made you a conqueror. That's a promise. God has made you a conqueror. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Yet in all these things, how many's ever had those things? How many's ever had those things? Yet in all these things, we are what? More than conquerors through him who loved us. Woo! For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When the truth that you are a conqueror becomes your yes, and you begin to declare, I'm a conqueror over this present situation. I'm a conqueror over this circumstance. When that becomes the truth in your life, you will conquer. Hallelujah, because God's word is alive and will not return to us void. Confessing God's word by faith, just like you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that he's the truth of your life. When you make that confession of faith, things begin to change. Come on, high five somebody say, God's changing some things. He's made us more than a conquerors. Woo. Number six, number six, and I'm just about to close because I got two more. Number six, God has already provided a way out. Woo, that's shouting ground right there. God has already provided a way out. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such is common to man. But God is faithful. Woo, come on. How many can grab a hold of his faithfulness? God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but the, with the temptation, will also make a way of escape. Woo! That you may be able to bear it. With the temptation, God said, I, the devil might be tempting you. But guess what? I give you a way out. <laughs> God will give you a way out. I say, God will give you a way out. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, God's giving you a way out. You know, uh, several years ago when uh, my, my daughter Emily was dating Derek, and one of the first things that we did, we went to Tulsa, and one of the first things to get, kind of get to know Derek a little bit, you know, I, I'd, I'd already kind of warned him that I was a packing preacher. You better be careful with my daughter. And um, y'all know what I mean by that. So um, anyways, so we're up there, and we're doing the, those, the, what is it called, the, the escape rooms? How many ever been to an escape room before? I know, there is a way out, but I wanted to leave him there. I was looking for a way to leave him there, so I was trying to mislead him and stuff like that. He's a pretty smart kid. But anyways, you know what I mean? You can be in one of those, those escape rooms and not know the next step, not understand what to do next. But how many know there's always clues? Come on, somebody. You catch what I'm throwing at you. There's always clues. There's those times that God's giving you a clue what to do next. You just got to be obedient to it. I mean, no, you will get thrown out of an escape room if you take a sledgehammer in there and just bust through all the walls to get through. You won't make it through there. I mean, no, many Christians, that's all they think they can do. They get a sledgehammer and make it their own way and bust through all the walls. I mean, it don't work that way. God gives you those clues. He gives you those little tugs in your heart so you can go through the next door and accomplish the next thing. And then he always provides a way out. Come on, somebody. I said he always provides a way out. I got nervous there for a little bit because some of the clues just didn't make sense to me. One is because it's in Oklahoma. There are a lot of things in Oklahoma that don't make sense. They're right, Vincent. I'm just kidding. He's from Oklahoma. We pray for him all the time. You know, um, there's just, just, just things that are just different in Oklahoma. I think I'm in a way, I'm in this escape room in Oklahoma. This, this is going to be different. And sure enough, man, there were some questions and things that I'm like, and looked at in, in them. You can't Google it there. They won't let you, you know, you can't. They, in fact, they take the Wi-Fi off there and all that. You can't get a signal in that room. So I thought, I'll, I'll Google my way out of this. Anyways, plus I was showing off a little bit. I wanted to let Derek know I'm smart. Come on, any, any dads know what I'm talking about. 
And I look like a total fool that day. <laughs> it was like, I literally thought I'd get a sledgehammer and get out of here. And, uh, but, I mean, you know, even in the midst of that, when I could just calm down and just think about it and just meditate on it, I got out of there. Thank the Lord. And, of course, Miss Daphne's a whole lot smarter than me. And he who finds a wife. Amen. What's that amen over there? But <laughs> he knows Miss Daphne. She is a lot smarter than me. <laughs> and she, got, she helped me out of that situation. Amen. amen. I mean, God's going to put people in your life that's going to help you out. And then if that don't work out, God's always provided a way out. Come on, high five somebody and say, God's providing a way out. And number seven. Hallelujah. Somebody say number seven. Hallelujah. Check this one out. God has already blessed you. Already. Somebody say already. God has already blessed you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, who has blessed us. Who has blessed us with ever spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are already blessed. Come on, somebody. That should get you excited. You're already blessed. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know how hard it is. Your mind is not going to change anything. But declaring that I'm already blessed. I'm blessed in this situation. God's provided a way out. He's called me to be more than a conqueror. He's given me the strength to get through this. He's prospering me every step of the way. God is working it out on my behalf. Woo! God is in this situation, and we're coming out on the other side. Hallelujah. Come on. We're coming out on the other side. Hallelujah. I said, we're coming out on the other side. Amen, amen, amen. You remember um, um, the three Hebrew um, kids? They, they were, um, they were uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember those guys? And they would not bow to the idols. So what did the, what did the king do? Well, I'm just going to. Throw you in the fire. See how good you do in that. But how many know in the midst of that fire, the king looked down into that fire and said, well, well, there's another man in the fire. Y'all remember that story? There's a fourth man in the fire. Even though it might seem like you're getting burned up, there's a fourth man in the fire. And if you realize, if you remember the rest of that story, when they came out of that thing, they didn't even smell like smoke. In fact, the, the guards were trying to spark it up even more, get that fire even Hotter and hotter, and they, they burned up. Hallelujah. Let me know your enemy will even burn up when they get around you, but you won't even smell like smoke. You're coming out smelling like, like roses. Hallelujah. Why? Because you're, you, you've got God on your side. Jesus is the fourth man in the fire. Come on, somebody. I said, Jesus is your fourth man in the fire. You might be facing some stuff, but Jesus is still with you. Come on, I said, Jesus is with you. Go on, high five somebody and say, Jesus is the fourth man in the fire. Oh, high five somebody and say, he's the fourth man in the fire. That means he's with me. Lord, I said, he's with me. He'll never leave me, no forsake. Man, this should put a smile on your face right now. If you're frowning, you need to get, you need to get saved. I'm just saying. Because it don't matter what you're facing, God can get you through on the other side. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for today? Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. We're so grateful that you're going to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ever ask or think. Father, I thank you for just a mighty move of your presence today. Lord, we lift up all those that are about to be water baptized right now as, as a church. We thank you, Lord, that this is just an outward expression of an inward work, and that you're already working on their behalf. So we as a church, we unite our hearts with them. We hook up with them. We're committed with them that this is such an amazing, life-changing event for them. And they want the, want the whole church and everybody know what Jesus is doing in their lives. Father, we thank you for it. We give you praise, Father, for it. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said.